All right, Jason, you can go. All right. Welcome, everybody. I'm Jason Baca. As Charlotte said, I teach out in Hillsboro. All right, so we're kind of looking at some of the design principles. It's kind of how we put together all of these things. So as Charlotte mentioned before, Charlotte's been on the team for quite a long time. I don't remember exactly how long. It's like 10 years or something, Charlotte? Close. Yeah. So what we do in council is we we look at all of the things that we do in the curriculum, and we try to figure out sort of the best path forward. And we do that by looking at these design principles, which are going to be shown here well, they're here on the left, but we're also going to kind of show them again in just a second. Um, but we we take into consideration a lot of things. We actually have somebody that comes in from from equity, from an equity lens and kind of shows us some of the, the things inside of the curriculum and to make sure that we're as equitable as possible. There's also people that are looking at NGSS standards and making sure that we're completely aligned. So it's it's a process. And so we kind of do this as we go. So you can see on there that we have differentiation, culturally responsive, and so on and so forth. We try to make sure that all of this is taken care of. Plus, you know, in these webinars, as you are in right now, if you give us comments, we will take those to heart. And we, we try to create the curriculum around what people want. We're just five teachers in the, in the state. So, all right, Charlotte, will you go to the next one for me? So here is our unit essential question is how do cells, tissues, and organs of the body work together to maintain balance and perform all of the body's function? So this was basically the, in, in the old school way where we talk about cells and how cells and tissues become uh, an individual and that individual has all of these things that happen inside. So if you've been following the curriculum, unit one is biodiversity, unit two is all about macromolecules and it is a huge unit. And so as Charlotte said earlier, this one is quite a bit shorter. And so it kind of, it feels like, I mean, I would say I get through it in about a month, maybe maybe two at most. All right. So here is the roadmap for the entirety of the unit. Uh, another thing that chemistry had done that we really liked is uh, we took this roadmap. So healthy heart rate is where we start. Then we'll go into intro to cells, cell division, cancer, human development, stem cells, and then end with two, actually it's three little tiny mini units, which is heart rate and exercise. And then kind of bringing it back to 3.1. Most of the curriculum does that. It, it starts in a place and then it ends going back to where we were at the beginning. Uh, those are our performance expectations, otherwise known as standards. And then the anchoring phenomenon, there is one for every single unit. This one is that the heart beats faster as we exercise. A couple of helpful things on here. You'll see the unit outline. Uh, I use the unit outline all the time just to kind of make sure that I'm not missing anything. So if there's something that's brand new, we put it on the unit outline so you can kind of see it. It's just a really easy way because if you're like me, you go in and you kind of make it your own. And then it's always nice to go back to the outline to figure out what's new, what's changed. Because as I said earlier, we're, we're kind of dealing with, you know, trying to make sure that we meet the standards, but also that we are, are being... Uh, resident of, of the people that are in our classes. And then there's a student interactive notebook. Uh, Miss, Miss Denis might talk about that one just a little bit. Yeah, so I use the student interactive notebook regularly. I actually just um, was, had a long conversation with my classes over the last couple of days about how they can use the student interactive notebook as a tool. So I'll just open it here to show you. Um, it's set out um, with all of the essential questions in a tracker so that the students can actually reflect on their learning at the end of every at the end of every task. It also gives them a spot to um, to identify questions uh, that they have so that they have a place where they can if they're looking at something um, and they don't get what's going on, they can write that down so that they can capture that question. Um, but in addition to that, there is a section in this interactive notebook for each task. So the it allows them to track if it says, have a discussion at your table and write down 
what you're discussing, there's a place for them to do that. Um, it allows them to do a little reflection and there are some, there's a at least one reflection question at the end of every task set. And then it reminds them at each, at the end of every task to add any words from that um, task to their word wall, which is up at the top. And then, um, and then remind them to go back to the learning tracker and fill in an answer to that essential question. Um, some people prefer to do this in like a physical notebook. I have found that when I have tried a physical notebook, I end up, there are papers everywhere and no student can ever find their papers, but I always find them on the floor. So I prefer the digital version because I know that I can assign it in Canvas and that I know that I can access every student's copy of the digital document. I can look at that digital document at any time to see if they're keeping up with it. And it also allows them some built-in uh, opportunities for review that I don't have, that I don't go, have to go and create. I mean, I give them a review before a test, for example, but there are opportunities along the way for them to do some studying um, that are a little bit more scaffold than just for me to say to them, oh, go study. And those are all built in here. So these have been a, these have come a long way, I think. I, but I, I enjoy that I like to use them. All right, so 3.1, this is where we start with our, our overarching thought, which is what do we know about heart rate? What parts of your body are involved in controlling it? One thing that I find really early in this is that kids, they have a pretty good idea. They, they know their heart increases when they exercise. I don't think I've ever asked a student and they didn't know, but most of them don't know why, right? Some of them might know a little bit about some oxygen and other things, but for the most part, it's kind of a blank canvas. They know it goes up, but they're not really sure the reason for it. And so we kind of start with, you know, sort of a KWL sort of chart where, where you go through and you figure out what they know, you know, and what do they want to know? And then what is a healthy heart rate? You kind of talk about that. There's a little video that's there that, that shows how to take your heart rate and then what a heart rate should be. Uh, it's obviously different if you are male or female or if you are older or younger. And then there's a career connection on there with a cardiovascular tech that we kind of watch. We try to put as many individuals in certain jobs in the curriculum as possible so they can see people doing the jobs that involve whatever the unit is. And then you'll see this on every single slide. There is a, a tracker at the end, so they can kind of come back and, and fill that in as they go. And I think, Charlotte, yours is in the, the interactive notebook. Yeah, we the, we used to offer an, or have a different document. Some people like to have a different document. We The feedback that we got was that not very many people were using that, and it was an additional document for us to uh, produce. So we've kept it in the interactive notebook. Um, and if you prefer to do it on a separate document, you can pull that out for yourself. So in 3.2, this 3.2 is actually an area where uh, that's a task that's relatively new, uh, came uh, the first year after maybe the, well, I can't remember now, either it was right before COVID or right after COVID, I can't remember. But there was an, certainly an area of, you know, that was lacking, which was microscope work and looking at different kinds of cells and being able to see what different kinds of cells actually look like. And so uh, Jesse Chamberlain and I, some of you know Jesse, um, collaborated to develop a document or develop an, a task where students um, had an opportunity to review the levels of organization, which they've learned in, you know, it's a part of the middle school standards, um, and then identify some major differences between plant, animal, prokaryotic, eukary and eukaryotic cells, and then to actually use microscopes to, um, to observe these cells. Now, this kinds of cells that you may be able to offer to students on microscope slides could be different. I've heard of some patterns teachers who are making their own slides um, with onion cells, for example. Um, so you may have to adapt what is here to what you have available. 
Um, what I wanted to show you, whoops, sorry about that. Uh, let me show you the digital student document. That will give you an idea of what students would be doing. But notice that in all of these, there are slides also. I prefer to to put slides on the, um, on the big screen and then have students following along on their document. Um, but we do have a printable student document for this one as well. So let me just show you what that looks like. So they look first at the um, levels of organization. This I actually pulled in to my copy of the interactive notebook and they guess how, and there's a slide that goes with this with pictures. What uh, what do they think the order is from the, from the largest to the smallest? So that would go of course from biosphere all the way down to Adam. Um, but they work with an elbow partner and they, and this is a drag and drop Google drawing. So they can just take the words and drag them in. Um, so that's pretty quick. And then um, what they do is that they figure out, well, where do human beings fall? They have an opportunity to do some collaboration where each student chooses one or more different types of cells and uh, finds a picture of those type cell types and then what those cells, what types, what the functions of those cells are. And then they can collaborate um, and share at their table group to get a wide variety of different kinds of cells that are in human beings. And then they do a, just a little bit of research. And this question down here, I'm just looking for, you know, a sentence or two about the fact that during development, different kinds of cells are made inside, um, inside a fetus. Then there's some kind of older, older school types of things. We let them, in my school, we let them use uh, internet images or and I pull a cart of textbooks in. We still have, a, we still have a, a library room full of textbooks. We don't use them very often, but this is an example of a time when I do use the textbook. I let them open up to those beautiful pictures of cells and find the right pieces and label them here, both plant and animal. And then, um, Go back to one of the, you know, things that again are in the middle school standards. I know that in Beaverton, uh, every student comes in knowing this idea of the mitochondria and being the powerhouse of the cell. I don't know why that's the one thing that they uh, latch onto and remember, but um, they many, many, many students uh, come in with that. But we. Uh, allow them here to pull some of that prior knowledge from the analogy that they may have seen. Sometimes it's a city, sometimes it's a, um, you know, they have various analogies. So they do that. And then all of this is tracked with the slides, right? There are some pictures that show um, diff these different things. And so it's kind of a, in my classroom, I do it kind of as a little bit of a back and forth. Um, so opportunity for Venn diagrams about differences between plant and animal and prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. And then the meat of this is them looking at the cells under the microscope. So there's, we, I do a little bit of a primer on microscope use because they may not have used a microscope in quite a few years. And they then have, I have them actually take their, use their cell phone to take a picture through the microscope lens. Uh, and to insert that picture digitally. If you prefer them to do sketches, that can uh, also happen. Uh, on the printable document, there is, are some you know, basic rules for, um, for drawings. And so I have them look at at least one animal cell, one plant cell, and one bacterial cell. They draw, they identify the magnification, and then they do a quick summary. So, um, this is, like I said, relatively new. I just did, yeah, 221. So that was during COVID, or I guess we were on hybrid. That was when we came back during hybrid. But I just did a little bit of cleaning up of this document just um, just the other day, actually, to, um, to have it look a little bit more updated. So I also uh, have a slideshow here of images of suggested specimens. I say suggested, but they're just an ex a, a series of example specimens that you might, if you need to buy slides to do this activity, um, slides that you might consider purchasing, uh, or maybe you have a community college or uh, university nearby who might that might be able to spare some extras. Maybe they have some that they could donate to you. Really, you just wanna have a wide variety. I have things on there like 
human blood smear and amoeba, and then a variety of different bacteria. And um, I had a trusted uh, teacher assistant take photographs and put those under the, um, take photographs under the microscope. And so I was able to collect um, a slide deck that has, um, that has a whole bunch of different specimens in it. And students are gonna choose from among those, they don't certainly don't look at them all. So the big goal here is not memorizing the organelles. It's getting students to think a little bit about the fact that a cell is full of a bunch of different minor or you know smaller pieces, that each of those small pieces has a job. Um, and we're introducing the idea of microscope use. We're not having them do a lot of focusing and refocusing. I actually focus all of the specimens in advance on this task to make things go a little bit faster. Yeah, so I'm I'm pretty old school on a lot of that stuff. So I use a lot of the slides that we've already had. So the blood is one of the ones that's really interesting, especially when you're looking at human blood versus like frog blood, because frog blood has a nuclei and human blood does not. Um, but we do the onion and all of that stuff as well. For the labeling, we started doing about, I don't know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we started doing shrinky dinks. When I was a kid, that was a big thing around my house. So we create little shrinky dinks of the cells and the kids make them into little keychains and they, they kind of like them. They're super cool. So it's a good way for them to sort of label the cell. Uh, this is 3.3, .3, which is how do cells divide? So we're talking about mitosis. Uh, meiosis actually occurs later. Uh, we don't talk about meiosis at this point, but we do, and this is the sort of the old school way again, we do onion root tips. And so you can grow them yourself if you'd like, or you can buy them. I suggest buying them because growing them is kind of a pain. Um, but they are looking at, it's kind of a scavenger hunt for us. So they go through and they figure out which cells are in which phase, and then we get a percentage. And so the percentage is kind of important because around 90 to 95% of them are going to be in interphase, which obviously is not a phase of mitosis, but it's still an important phase in the process. Uh, and so we go through and we look at each one of those and do sort of a, an old school lab with these and onion root tips. But yeah, you talk about chromosomes for the, we've, we again, a lot of this stuff came right after unit two, which talked about DNA and it talked about the mitochondria and it talked about protein synthesis and all of that stuff. So, you know, seeing some of those parts in real life is kind of interesting. It is important, I think it's important to note that the assessment boundary for the cell division standard in the NGSS is very clear. It does not, um, the, the assessment boundary is before any memorization of any steps. So although we talk about the steps of mitosis, all the phases, um, I don't have students memorize them. Um, we talk really more about interphase versus M. Um, so either they're doing their jobs or they're dividing and the dividing takes a very short period of time to, you know, and they're able to calculate that it's about 10% of the time. But, I do feel on accident, they learn the phases. Yeah. Even though I mean, I'm not they definitely trying. have to, they see pictures of them, but it's not something that I assess. Yeah. So of course, once students have an understanding of how how cells divide and we, we get to development a little bit later, um, but invariably the question comes up, well, what happens if cells don't, um, if their division cycle doesn't correspond to the cell cycle, right? That 10% of the time, if they're dividing more often than they should or sitting in, for some reason, going through interphase faster. And so this, of course, is the topic of cancer. Um, I've had some situations in terms of, you know, being culturally responsive. This is one area where it's nice to know your students. Um, if you know, for example, that a student has a parent or a family member who has gone through cancer recently, I know that I tend, I share my personal family story, my, my sister and all of my cousins on in um, in my generation on my parents' side or my mother's side, all have had breast cancer. So I'm very open about that. And I 
tell students if there's something about, we're going to be talking about cancer next time. So if there's something, if that's a sensitive subject for you, please come and talk to me, let me know, and we can um, figure out if it's going to, if, if it, because it could potentially be a triggering thing for them. So I just wanted to put that out there. It's a good way to, um, to be culturally responsive for different students' um, situations. So this task starts out with a, a really old activity, but that came out of the National Institutes of Health. Um, they had a, for a while, they had an education branch at the NIH and they worked, they had people who worked on developing curriculum. And I have held on to this task for a really long time because I do think that it is, it is quite good. It's called Understanding Cancer. And in this task, what the students do is they watch short clips that were produced, short video clips that were produced by the NIH for the purpose of this lesson. And that uh, the people who are featured in these clips, let me just bring this up for you. Uh, let me go back here to the slides. Um, the people who are represented in the video clips are actually cancer researchers from history. They're real people who, uh, some of whom are from the 18th century, so they've they've passed away, but the people are actual people who were part of what we have learned about cancer over the years. So there's a series of videos, like I said, and then a series of animations that talks about the cell cycle. And the students work, they don't have to watch all of the videos or all of the animations on their own. They use, uh, a, we set it up using a technique that we use a lot in patterns biology, which is the idea of the data sharing slideshow where different student groups investigate different components and then they have to work together to share that information. And so it allows the class to cover a lot of information in a shorter period of time but each student group or each student, depending on how you do it, becomes an expert in one or two of the areas. So let me show you what that student document looks like. So the first section um, also actually has a reading strategy associated with it. So this is the, the section that has the, the little clips, the video clips. So the first one, Ha is uh, the video clip is linked there and it's a representation of Percival Pott who was a physician in London in the 18, 1780s. And we did put the whole text, you can see that the, the text is just a long you know, paragraph. So the clips, video clips are quite short. Um, and we suggest that students use this strategy called stoplight. And so we've done an example for them where we've identified something in red that was the, what they might find confusing or what they might wanna know more about. A key idea would be marked in green and then a key term or definition would be marked in yellow. And so we've given them an example of what we want, that, want them to do. And then we ask them to write a seven word summary. I say seven plus or minus one. It allows them to understand a little bit more about what uncertainty is. Um, they make a, a claim in seven words or less, and then they pull evidence from the text to um, to provide as evidence, right? So they, they, sorry, they provide quotes or information from the text as evidence. So I have, uh, I suggest we, we, I go through this one pretty, uh, pretty closely. We watch the video together. We identify the key information, look at the claim and look at the evidence, and then, there are three other scenarios. I'm just gonna show this in the... in the non-print layout, so it's a little bit easier to see. Um, there are three more scenarios, three more videos, and I have nine groups in my classes usually. And so what I usually do is I have each group focus on one video. And so we have three possible groups to look at 
information for or three different claims for the same video, three different sets of evidence for the same video. So um, in case you have kids absent or if you have kids who, um, you know, groups who are more or perhaps a little bit less productive in a day, uh, you're not um, having one single group be responsible for all of the information about one particular video. So that's the first part. And then they, so that's the kind of history and some anecdotal evidence. And then the second section of this task has to do, it has several different animations and they are about how proto-oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes when mutated cause the cell to go out of compliance with the cell cycle clock. And as a result, um, end up dividing more often than they should. So that's the actual inside the cells, what happens inside the cells um, that explains then the anecdotal evidence that was represented in the historical um, or historically framed videos earlier. And again, there's one, one example, the students then in their, in their small group work on one or two of these, and then um, we're able to piece together the whole story about what happens in the cells. So I like to put this at this spot in, I, I like that we're talking about cancer in this spot in the curriculum. It used to be in uh, in the genomics unit, but during, um, during our COVID year, we shortened the genomics unit and pushed, pulled, or I guess pulled cancer into homeostasis unit or cells to organisms. Um, and I like it here because it connects directly with mutations, which is at the end of unit two um, about biomolecules. And so it, it reinforces that idea because of course that will come back again in unit four genomics and again in the evolution unit. So I like the idea that we're starting to talk about mutations a whole unit earlier and that we are talking about in unit two, unit three, unit four and unit five. Now, one thing that I kind of want to bring up, if you go up a little bit, Charlotte. Yeah. So the last video, so all of them are dramatizations except for the last one. The last one is actually real footage from uh, troops coming back from war. One thing that's really interesting and sort of sad about this one is that uh, black and brown Americans that went over and fought for our country are not allowed on the beach in this particular one. So it, it kind of led to a really interesting conversation about why that was and kind of where we've been. And so... I feel like if you do scenario four, you definitely need to sort of make the kids know that that's what's happening because it's basically footage of a bunch of individuals that are all of Caucasian descent or whatever that are on the beach. And you're like, well, where, where are the people that represent me, for example? You know, they're, they're not there. And so it, it's a really neat opportunity to sort of bring that in because we do talk about that stuff again in unit four. So the follow-up to that, there are two possible follow-ups to the in, you know, to the basic understanding of cancer. One is that students have an opportunity to use uh, bioinformatics. So a website called, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking. I'll pull it up here to see. Oh, BLAST, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, they use the BLAST site, which is an alignment tool, which exists at, um, it's an internationally used alignment tool for DNA sequences. And students are able to, there's a scenario, I think it originally came out of um, University of Pennsylvania, this, this task, um, but they are able, they have, they're, they have access to sequences from I think five or six different patients and the idea is to look at their risk factors and to see whether or not they actually have a BRCA1 uh, mutation. BRCA1 is a mutation in a tumor, or I should say BRCA1 is a tumor suppressor gene and uh, mutations in certain spots in that tumor suppressor gene cause cancer, specifically breast and ovarian cancer. And so there is a um, section of this that also talks about uh, genetic counseling right? Genetic counseling comes up again in unit four, but it's a really interesting career. I think that had I not become a teacher, I might've become a genetic counselor. Who knows, maybe in retirement. Um, but that students really seem to like that activity. They, they like to be able to know that they're looking at actual gene sequences um, that are 
and and that the to know that doctors and specialists are able to look at the gene sequence and in a matter of minutes know whether or not there's a mutation in that particular gene. Again, I share with my, share my own family's story. My sister has a does not have a BRCA1 mutation, but she does have a mutation in a different tumor suppressor gene. And this um, this tool was exactly what was used to identify her mutation. So I share that with the students. And then two years ago, um, a colleague and I felt it was felt that we wanted to highlight uh, Henrietta Lacks. This for in my school, this unit often happens uh, in January leading into February. And so we decided that we wanted to write a lesson about Henrietta Lacks. And I wanted to point that one out because it's relatively new. Um, and the, so this is a picture of Henrietta Lacks. And if you're not familiar with her story, Henrietta Lacks was a, a young black woman who lived in Baltimore and she went to Johns Hopkins hospital and was diagnosed with cervical cancer. And this is in the 19, gosh, oh, Jason, help me, 40s, 50s, 50s, I think. Um, and at that time, there were no, there was a lot of research being done to try and find human cell lines. Um, there had not been any success in uh, developing cell lines that exist outside, outside of human, outside of the human body. And it turns out that uh, samples of patients' cells were being taken without their consent. And um, the cells that were taken from Henrietta Lacks's cervix actually ended up uh, producing the very first human immortal cell line. And if, if you are familiar with HeLa cells, or I know that I used those in the laboratory well before becoming a teacher, and I never knew anything about what they were until um, relatively recently. So yeah, she so she died relatively soon after her diagnosis. It, her cancer was uh, far advanced once she finally was able to get to the hospital. But you may have heard in the news that uh, Henrietta Lacks's family just recently, within the last six months, came to a settlement with Johns Hopkins because the cells, which became the cell line, were then sold. Millions and probably billions of dollars were made um, from the cell from the sale of these cells. But her family was never even informed until like 15 years ago that the cells had been taken from her. Not to mention that they were never told that they that that the cells were being sold. Um, and so just recently, within the last six months, uh, the family has come to an agreement with Johns Hopkins, some kind of uh, settlement with Johns Hopkins. Um, so all of those questions, the story of her life, the story of the medical racism that occurred to her, the fact that the, many things were kept from her family for many decades, um, all of that comes up in this lesson. And this lesson came, we did not write the lesson from scratch. We made some edits to a lesson. I'm going to go back to my um, print layout so I can see my citation here from uh, the K-20 Center at the University of Oklahoma. Um, but again, students work to jigsaw several articles and they take um, notes in a note taker. Let me just bring this up here uh, to show you what that note taker looks like. So in one student group, uh, each student, I do four person groups in my classroom and each student takes notes on one of the articles, but they work together on the same document so that each, um, each student can see the notes. Um, and then they're looking while they're reading for evidence that helps to support a pro or con stance about whether patient permission should be required for human cells for medical research. Now, nowadays, of course, we sign, uh, there are um, uh, there are agreements that we, that we sign for. Of course, that was not the case in Henrietta Lacks' time. Um, and then what the students do individually, once they have all of that information about the different, um, the different perspectives, so there's a legal perspective, family perspective, society perspective, medical perspective, and then they put their note taker in here and then they write a um they write a paragraph 
an argumentative mini essay, so to speak. And I like to do the roving paragraph tool. And uh, that's a it's a protocol that uh, that you can use in the classroom where the students write one sentence, then they share that sentence with the partner, and then they improve their sentence before moving on to their next uh, to the next part of their paragraph. And then it gets them talking, it gets them up and moving around, and it allows them to have ideas, uh, to hear feedback on their on their work, and it allows them to improve their work in the moment um, before they um, before they move on to the next part. So I, in, in the unit tracker, we have that listed as an extension, but I have now incorporated that and I do that task now every year. All right, 3.5. 3.5 is talking about how you grow from a single fertilized egg into you. So again, it's the whole basis of the unit is cells to organisms. So how do you go from a cell to a tissue to an organ and so on and so forth? And so there is a stem cells video that we watch. It is, you can kind of see it there. There It says in understanding stem cells, if you click on that. And so we kind of talk about how the cell starts as two cells, right? So a sperm and an egg and they come together. Now we don't really get into, at this point, uh, meiosis too much, but there is a little bit of talk about meiosis at this point but we talk about what stem cells are. I think a lot of students have heard about a stem cell, but they don't really know how that, you know, it's, it's basically obviously a cell without a job. And so how does it get its job and all of that stuff, it goes into play. And so it's another one of these concept maps where we take and we write down what happens as it goes through. There's a pretty good diagram underneath that shows the the blastula and the, the gastrula and how the cell becomes the different parts of the of the individual. And this is one of those concept maps as Charlotte showed before, where you double click on it and it is a drawing where you move the words into place. So things like blastocyst and mesoderm and ectoderm and all of those pieces that come into play and what becomes what. And so some of this is, is note-taking for, for my class. We go through this stuff in particular and then they go through and they fill out this as they go. And then there is a stem cell game. I'll go back to. So this is this is relatively new. Yeah. So I actually played this for the first time over the summer. I, I know Karen was there and a couple other individuals were there. We kind of played this game. And so you are taking uh, these cards and it says on there, print well in advance. And that's definitely what I need to do because I'm going to be doing this in the next couple months. And they, the kids are basically trying to create a cell from a stem cell that becomes a red blood cell or some other type of cell. And so they have these little cards that look like the ones there on the bottom. And they, they draw them just like any other card game. And they try to figure out how to put them together to create the cells that they create. And then there, there is a winner and, you know, it's a game. Uh, we also do a thing where the kids create a cell and there's another little board game that we kind of play that's kind of similar to this. So we're going to end up doing both of these things this year. But yeah. If you have access to a, a print shop in your district, uh, this is a um, great opportunity for you to get um, to get those cards. That That would be a great opportunity for you to get those cards printed. Um, cause it, I think that each deck has like 90 cards in it. So, um, you could probably get by with fewer, but I like this game because it, um, it talks about what happens in a, in a person's body, but also what can happen in a laboratory and that sometimes cells die in a laboratory, that there are mistakes that happen. Um, the, um, and that kind of thing, Jason, you're, can you give a little bit more detail? Because that create a cell game, we don't have it in the curriculum. Yeah, I'll, I'll find it. I'll put it in the thing. It's we, we have lab aids. And so it's basically this giant board and the kids create the red blood cell. They create a nerve cell. They create a sex cell and I think a skin cell. 
and they put them all on the little thing and then they go around and then they uh, they go into G0 if they are for example a nerve cell then they never leave and it's just the kids really like it it's sort of interesting because the kid that is the nerve cell goes directly to G0 and they're just like oh my gosh you know I don't get to play anymore, but then they become a red blood cell. But yeah, I'll put it in the thing. It's it's hard to explain, but it's kind of fun. They build it with clay, and then their cell changes. Yeah, it is just yeah. a side note. Hillsboro adopted lab aids, and so they have all of the lab aids materials, but we can't include it in patterns because it's a copyrighted thing. Yeah, and to the answer to like Karen's question, I know that Charlotte was saying over the summer that they either use Hillsboro, right? Don't you guys use us, our print shop, to print these cards? No, Avery got Avery did them for me. Oh, okay, so you Another did use us, but yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a pretty good print shop. Yeah, but that's a great idea, Karen, about using your makerspace, talking to them about getting that kind of thing taken care of. Mm -hmm. But it is a fun game. I did it for the first time last year. Uh, this was something that came, one of the other people from the council found this game online. It's made, it's freely available from the American Museum of Natural History. They have a whole uh, so-called ology website, which is with that little logo that we have there. And um, we had been searching for something um, when Flash went away, uh, right in the middle of COVID, we lost a really great, um, a really great stem cell activity that was all flash based and it has not been re reproduced um, without flash. And so we'd been looking for something and our colleague, Avery Marvin, who works at Liberty High School in Hillsboro found this game um, and kids had a great time, great time playing it last year. But if you want to do it, you want to get started getting your cards printed. All right, so now we're getting, we, you know, we in about 40 minutes, we've done five, talked about five tasks and what's gonna take us the next 45 minutes to talk about three <laughs> um, or two or three more. Um, so in 3.6, this is where we hit the crux of the, of the idea behind the, behind homeostasis and how cells have to work together to create a functioning organism. So we've kind of had all of the pieces, the little bitty pieces that kind of now at this point fit together, that all of the, the systems that have been developed in a, in a fetus, for example, they all have to work together in order to achieve homeostasis. And so this is, um, this is a task where the students are learning also about feedback loops. And so there are a variety of different examples of feedback loops uh, from human, uh, human homeostasis that we use as examples, which we'll show you a couple of them here. Um, but then the students are also practicing modeling in this task. Um, and there are a variety of different ways that students can do the modeling. They know some basics about heart rate at this point uh, because they know from their own experience, but then they also uh, read an article and model a feedback loop. And they create the, the models that they develop early on um, tend to be a little bit um, simpler. And then we'll talk a little bit later about how after they do an experiment or an investigation about heart rate that the students have an opportunity to come back and revisit their model so that they can uh, edit it and, and make it better. So there are a variety of ways that you could do this. Um, the first thing that they could do is that they could build an build the concept map with their group using sticky notes. So I'll just pull that open here. This is the student document that shows it. Um, the article is included. Um, we ask them to read or highlight using either if electronically or uh, you know on paper if you're printing the article. There are some resources associated with that a vocabulary list because there's a fair bit of vocabulary that may or may not be familiar. Um, and the article basically walks through or revises or talks about heart rate or re, um, gives them an opportunity to review what a standard um, average heart rate is, resting heart rate. And then 
talks about what happens when exercise happens. So that's called the stressor response. And there are a series of things that occur. Now, what the students are gonna do then, let me make this a little larger so you can see it a little bit better. We give them a basic but incomplete feedback loop. And I guess I should say, I should have showed you this earlier, um, a couple of feedback loop examples that we give, right? They define the difference between, with some examples, define the difference between a negative feedback loop and a positive feedback loop. That's always a challenging one because they um, sometimes come in with the misconception that a positive feedback loop always means that the end result is positive rather than a positive feedback loop actually just making something go higher and higher um, or that the same, the same type of thing continues to occur. Uh, so that's something that you've probably encountered if you've taught feedback loops before. But I really like to use the examples of things that they're familiar with. Um, this one is one that gets a little bit of, you know, oohs and ahs, uh, but it has to do with the initiation of initiation of labor, right? So uh, when students are um, thinking about these two examples, they have a little bit better idea about what a feedback loop actually is. And then they apply that knowledge to the development of their own feedback loop with their group. So I stock up on pink and blue and yellow sticky notes. Um, I kind of hoard those colors over the course of the year whenever the department purchases sticky notes because everything in the article, we've asked them to um, highlight using the same color code that is in the slides. So what's in the sensory path would be red, what is related to the control center or the, the brain in yellow, and then the effector or the, the thing that carries out the response in blue. And so I provide each group with a variety of different sizes of sticky notes in those three colors. And then they work together to translate, so to speak, the article into a model. And so we provide them with this very basic setup to begin with, but we let them know that this is an incomplete feedback loop and it's their job to work together to flesh it out a little bit more. Now, if you, um, if you prefer, you can have students do this electronically, but it's a little bit less um, interactive for them. Um, there is, I developed during COVID a drag and drop version of this flow chart, um, and then they write about the process as, so if you, it's a different type of assessment, the same concepts, but they're not doing the modeling themselves. Or if you, maybe if you have students who need a little bit more support, then you could provide them with the drag and drop flow chart, which has all of the components already drawn there. Let me show you what that one looks like. So this is a Google drawing. Oh, it's taking a long time to load. There it is. Uh, so this is a Google drawing. This shows the whole, um, all the different possible pathways, all the different parts of the model. And then, so it is a little bit more challenging because it has more components, but because it's already all set out, um, the they're not developing their own model. So that's the second option for you. And then the third option would be that where students create their own visual representation of this all together. And we do have I've never done this this option in class, but we have a colleague who's done this quite successfully um, over long periods of time. Sorry, this is a, a that picture first picture got a little bit smushed, but here's an example of a drawn flow chart, um, uh, you know, a model, and it shows all you know different artistic components like neurons, axons, and dendrites, and those kinds of things. You have a picture of the heart over here. Um, this student even incorporated the um, chemical formulas for the hormones that are involved in this process, adrenaline and uh, acetylcholine. So we have a couple of examples of how you might, um, how you might incorporate 
that if you have students who are um, particularly artistic and you could even offer them potentially a choice of which type of thing that they want to do. We have a colleague on the council who works at the Milwaukee Academy of the Arts in North Clackamas uh, School District. And she often has her students do this version because she uh, has students who are very um, advanced in visual arts. But the main part or the main um, thing that's gonna take us probably the longest to talk about today is the um, investigation that is part, the scientific investigation that's part of this unit. And I'll just do the kind of the intro here, Jason, and then you can talk about the rest. So Jason mentioned earlier, yeah, yeah, good call about, um, yeah, do you wanna talk about homeostasis a little bit? It's not yeah. officially in the curriculum, but I think it's a funny one to, to add in and students like it. Would you mind clicking on it for me? Sure. So homeostasis is, is obviously a play on the word Homer and homeostasis. And so basically what we do is we have a, I have a little cup that has Homer's face on it and I just traced it on there. And I fill the different cups with, and you can see, I think the Homer cup is the yellow cup down there at the bottom. And they, they fill it up with a certain amount of water. And so you're trying to get Homer to be Homer's color because obviously Homer is yellow. And so they you get about four or five kids up there. One of them is going to be the hypothalamus. Their job is to make sure that he stays within homeostasis. And so to do that, he has to maintain a certain temperature. He has to maintain a certain color and he has to not lose all of his water. And so once I put that cup up there, I fill it up and then I poke a hole in it and it starts to run. And then the kids sort of panic as his temperature goes down. So you have a kid that's on hot, you have a kid that's on cold, and then you have a kid that's on orange. And so I know it doesn't sound right, but when you put orange in there, it makes him go back to yellow when it's mixed with the, the clear water. And so that's kind of how it works. And it just becomes this thing where the kids are sort of trying to keep him at that. So the reason I do it is one, it's fun. And two, I think it's really interesting to sort of talk about how difficult it is for us to maintain homeostasis with all of the things that are occurring in our lives, right? So all the things that you have to do to maintain the temperature that you maintain, right? 98.6 or around there. Like, how do we do that? You know, eating food and exercising and, you know, doing all these things that should change that temperature, but they really don't. And so how do we do that. And so it goes back to the feedback loops and all of that stuff. And I do this the same day as we go right into the next activity, which Charlotte was just going to mention, which is a heart rate lab. Yeah, I had never, Jason had been telling me about this homeostasis for a while. I had never seen it in action until this summer. Um, so I think that I will try to do this this year. This may be one of those things that I do. We end on a, we have all of our breaks this year in Beaverton end on after an odd day. So we have like our A day and then we go on break. So um, I have most of my biology classes on A day this year. So I may uh, end up doing this on one of those days that we have a little bit of extra time. But it was interesting. It was really interesting to see how that worked and it gets students involved and they know whether or not uh, Homer is healthy or not based on uh, how filled his cup is and how what color he is and what temperature he is. So kind of a fun one to add. I know sometimes our, I speak for myself, especially since COVID, it's been hard to keep some fun into the classroom. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things where the kids come back and they're like, remember that day? And so, you know, I try to get as many of those moments as possible. Yeah, Kim, we're trying, trying. Sometimes I would love, if if anybody, Kim just mentioned that she really likes the game editions. If there are, are any other things that you all have in your uh, arsenals of teacher materials that you think would fit, that would allow for a, for a good um, day of fun that supports the other things that are in the curriculum. We would love to hear about any of those. 
So the um, the design principles that Jason mentioned earlier, and I know that many of you have taught multiple different patterns classes or have been doing patterns biology for quite some time, uh, but some of you are also relatively new to the patterns fold, so to speak. And so we wanted to pay some specific attention to design principle number three today, which is uh, the inquiry design principle. And the idea there is that every unit has some component of inquiry because that's what scientists and engineers do. And the inquiry tasks all follow a very basic pattern, which is uh, that the students at the outset make a guess based on some kind of observation, something that's related to the real world, uh, but that they couldn't possibly answer without an investigation about that topic. Now in chemistry and physics, of course, these um, the inquiry experiments often um, or almost always, certainly in physics, uh, I think in chemistry, come up with a mathematical model. But in biology, that's a little bit harder, right? Because the patterns that we're working on in biology are so much more complex. We're dealing with things like carrying capacity or homeostasis or, um, or exponential growth. Sometimes the mathematics that our students are, the math levels of mathematics don't support the use of a mathematical model or um, there's another good example of a pattern that we're looking at in biology that we, or like evolution, right? We can't really model evolution with a mathematical graph. So um, in biology, we have to be picky and, and make sure that we're choosing all the opportunities that we can to get the students to do graphing about relevant topics. So when the unit is all about the physiological response to exercise, we can't ignore this opportunity for them to do an experiment. Um, and it also gives them an opportunity to write their own investigation. Um, I know that many of us have uh, standards that require students to actually design their own or write their own procedure. If you've been teaching as long as I have, you might remember the SIM, um, which was a requirement back in the day for students to actually develop their own lab from scratch. Um, I like that idea, right? I was a little sad with the, well, I might not have been so sad when the when the uh, requirement went away, but the practice of writing their own procedure with some scaffolding, I think was a really great thing that, um, that this task that we're about to discuss actually gives them the opportunity to do. So, but I do want to point out the vertical alignment of skills, the fact that they're doing this type of thing guessing basing on the observation, then they determine an inquiry or they do an investigation that helps them determine some kind of math, in this case, a mathematical pattern. They work to understand what the patterns means through something called a data discussion, right? It used to be called board meeting um, when we were doing everything on physical whiteboards. And then at the end of the process, they go back to the initial guess that they made and they re re predict on the same question, but now of course they have their um, their graph as support and their and the results that they got as support, and so they're able to make a much more um, hopefully a much closer to reality uh, prediction, and so they do have an opportunity then to test their prediction um, in this lab, which is not something that they can do in any other. Well, I guess we do test an enzyme lab too. So the question that we're answering, I'll just do this part really quick, Jason, then I'll turn it over to you, is that students are asking the question, how does a given exercise affect heart rate? And then how does that help us determine what the benefit of that heart rate um, is for certain kinds of exercise programs? So is it a cardio exercise? Is it a strength building exercise? Those things are determined based on the target heart rate of the exercise um, that the students generate in their in their results. Yeah, so we uh, this is the inquiry lab for the heart rate. There are a couple of different ways you can do this. Um, I suggest trying to do it electronically. So I know we use the things down there at the bottom, which are the vernier uh, probes. You don't have to use those. You could use a, you know a, either a watch or you could take it with your fingers, but taking it with your fingers has become super difficult when you're trying to do a lot of these activities. 
And so the ones that you see down there at the bottom, I have both varieties. We just got the ones on the right not too long ago, but the ones on the left, we use those in your hand. And so your hand has to be on them and it actually has to be a little bit wet. So like if it's super in the winter time, it, it doesn't work as right. So you have to make sure that you, you maybe add a little bit of water to your hands. But anyway, like you're gonna be doing some sort of activity that you can maintain for about 90 seconds, right? So if you can't do it for 90 seconds, I tell the kids, you can't do it. Like every year, I'm gonna do planks. I'm like, don't do planks. I don't think you can do planks for 90 seconds. They're like, oh, yes, I can. And then they do it and then they kind of cry because they can't really do planks for 90 seconds. But anyway, so there's there's those types of things. And then like Charlotte and I were talking the other day, like stair climbing. One of our examples was stork stair climbing if you go up and then you come back down again, you're going to lower your heart rate slightly. You know, I mean, I, I let them do certain things, even though I know it's probably going to have an impact just so they can find their error later. But that is one of those things. So they pick an exercise and they do it for four trials. And I usually try to have them do it. I don't know how Charlotte does it, but I have them do it. The same person does it four times because I want them to see that one person doing it four times because otherwise it's going to be a little bit different. And so I want them to have one person do it. And then you can kind of see the data that they collect. This is actually real data that they, they pulled. Um, I don't think that they had a heart rate of zero at zero, but you know, you can kind of see again, I'm showing you exactly what I see from the kids as they put it in there. And then, yeah, somebody got to 191, which, you know, it could be the the machines that they're using or just human error. We don't know. But then they also have their observations over there. I, I had another one that I was going to put on there that had a lot of observations. But this one just says sweating. But like, I want them to have those uh, qualitative observations as well. So they can say, well, you know, the first two trials was fine. And then I got a little more tired. And then maybe we see that in the data. The second one, the strap, that one goes around the chest. Um, and it works really well for things like push-ups or anything. Again, I don't know if you can do push-ups for 90 seconds, but with, if you have to use your hands for anything, it's it's pretty good. So you could play a game of tennis or whatever with that thing on. The only problem with it is, is that it does have to be against skin. And so students have to leave the room to put that one on. And then they graph it. And so if you can uh, actually go to the next slide, I think. Yeah, so this is just saying that you can do it with a Fitbit or use any other type of thing, and then you can they're going to do a share out at the end. If we go to the next one. So this is an example. So this is uh, a couple of students from Charlotte's class, uh, Easton and Evan, and they were doing ski jumps, which I assume is just jumping back and forth. Yeah, kind of like you're skiing. And then this is their graph. And this is actually a pretty decent graph. It shows that it is linear and then it sort of goes horizontal, right? So it's going up and then it kind of flat lines out. And so unlike the data that I showed you from me, it doesn't start at zero, right? Your heart rate starts somewhere a little bit higher and then goes up and then it sort of flattens out because there is that, that point where you kind of reach your top. Your heart rate does not continually go up like it showed in, in the data that I showed you to 191 and beyond, right? That's not how we do things. And again, that's because of homeostasis. Your body will shut you down before it lets you get that high. Uh, if you go to the next one. So same sort of thing. This graph is a little bit more stretched out. Um, you can see that we have error bars as a requirement on all of these to sort of show the error that may occur. And then this one, they went up and then went across. And then you kind of compare, like a lot of times we look at them, like a person that is in better health is going to have necessarily, they're going to have lower heart rate. Uh, again, it depends on the, the gender at birth and it depends on their age. And then the last one is our, our best one, right? So this one was running in place and you can see that they, they pretty much nailed it. Like it's across the board. They even have like what the units imply. And there's a lot of that in the curriculum where, you know, you have to explain what's happening in the graph with, with actual words. So they say these results imply that running in place will increase your heart rate. 
but you need to do it at least a couple of minutes to reach homeostasis. So they're they're using the terms that we want them to use, which is which is spectacular. And they had a ending heart rate of about 151. And then they had a prediction. But yeah, all every single one of these was something you can do for 90 seconds. So you didn't see any planks on there. They do try. Now, Jason, you mentioned that you have one person doing, one student doing the exercise four times. I actually yeah. have them make uh, heterogeneous groups. And I frame it that, the, the, the way I frame it is that when people are making exercise plans, they make the plans for perhaps uh, an age group of people, like they, a person might develop an exercise plan that's ideal for teenagers, mm -hmm. or they might produce an exercise plan that's ideal for um, uh, teenagers who identify as male. And so I let the students identify their group and, and, but they all have to agree that they will all do the exercise that is selected. So there's some banter back and forth about what exercise they end up deciding to, to do. We have a huge, we make a huge list of different exercises that would work. And I try not to have more than two groups in the same class do the same exercise, um, just so that we have a variety of data coming out of the, um, coming out of the process because the students end up doing um, you know, doing a share out. Now, one of the things we mentioned earlier was coming back to that initial guess. The first question that they ask or that we ask them is, I mean, before they even do the investigation is what will the heart rate of your, what will the average heart rate be for someone doing this exercise after, you know, 65 seconds of the exercise? And so of course, one, that's why here you have new prediction for heart rate after 65 seconds. Right. And this group, for example, 65 seconds is in the linear part. So their heart rate is still increasing at 65 seconds. But if you look, for example, at let's see, this one where they did the ski jumps, they were already in the homeostatic heart rate level at 65 seconds. So that's gonna, there are gonna be variations. Every since every exercise is a little bit different. And frankly, also, even if you have two groups that were doing the same exercise, they may or may not have the, you know, flattening out come out exactly at the same point in time. Now, sometimes people prefer to um, graph these or find that or students, sometimes if you have a student who's a Desmos whiz or if you're using um, Excel or Excel or sheets instead to do your graphing. Sometimes uh, students really want to um, end up with a graph that hits more of the points closer to the center. And so they might fit a logarithmic graph or a logarithmic best fit line here. I let them do that if they want, but it's a lot harder to explain because um, even though it hits the points a little bit better, a logarithmic graph actually has an asymptote. It doesn't actually end up flattening out completely. So there's always an increase, even though at the very end, the increase is relatively small. And so if theoretically, if you were doing the exercise for hours on end, uh, your heart rate would go so high that at some point your heart wouldn't be able to handle it. Um, I also do like to... Uh, to have students be able to explain what the slope of the linear line means. And it's the, of course, in this case, 0 0.6 beats per minute per second, meaning that while the, in the first 50 seconds or so um, of this exercise, the heart rate is going up by 0 0.6 beats per minute every second. So basically every 10 seconds, they're gaining a six beats per minute. So I do encourage students, especially if their mathematics skills are a little bit on the weaker side, I encourage them to use the, the biphasic graph. That's the level of um, complexity that we're encouraging here. And this, of course, they've seen this, if they've done the enzyme investigation, they've seen this type of graph before because the graph for this, the groups that test substrate concentration in the enzyme lab get also a biphasic graph like this, um, because at some level, there's just too much substrate, not enough enzymes in there. 
Yeah, and there are some in the teacher notes for this lab, there are some um, example links to example graphs so that you can see how they're how the two um, how the two lines are generated in Desmos and also how you can take off the like the extensions of this red line, for example, or the purple line is is only valid in the in quadrant one. And also we, this this group happened to cut off their um, their graph right at about 110 or 120 seconds. And there are some examples of Desmos uh, graphs so you can see exactly how those um, things are set up. And one thing I think we should mention is that this can be triggering for students that feel like they're out of shape or are out of shape. And that's why I always have one kid. And so I tell them before they create their groups that really make sure you have someone in your group that's willing to do this. Um, because yeah, if you have a group of, of four students that don't want to do this, it can be really difficult. They're like, I don't want to be the one that exercises. They don't have to do anything super intensive. They just need to do something, but still it, it does cause some anxiety for some kids. Agreed. And I think that there's a, there are lots of ways around, I mean, around or working with students who may have those considerations. So I always tell students that I'm willing to work with, uh, work with a situation if it arises. Certainly don't force anyone to do something that they're, um, that doesn't work for them, but I ask them to try to uh, be accommodating. So that, any questions about the we got a couple people comments. Okay, uh, can you talk about the question, is this exercise good for cardiovascular health? Yeah, good. So it turns out, and this is actually, let me go back to the, the student template for this task because this is where that is. Oh, is it opening? Oh, it's just loading. So let me bring this, make this a little bit bigger here. So it turns out that there are, um, and my mother who was a physical educator for many years actually helped me develop this part of the lab. And she kind of in informed me this things that I didn't know is that certain target heart rate is desirable for improvement of, you know, improvement of cardiovascular, you know, I get car cardiovascular health for lack of a better term. Um, certain target heart rates are best for that as opposed to target heart rates that might be used for um, uh, exercises that are meant to build strength as a comparison. So I'm going to scroll down to the analyze and interpret results section of this lab template. This is the, and then come just up from there. So it turns so I read an article um, online about heart rate zone training for cardiovascular exercise. And I found out that if your heart rate is between 70 and 85% of your maximum heart rate, that that's considered um uh that's considered the the target for cardio. And so students are able then to calculate their maximum heart rate is 220 minus their age. And then they calculate uh, 70 to 85% of that and then find out what the target range is for a person their age. And then they determine using their graph whether the homeostatic heart rate that their group achieved is, the, is within this range or not. And if it is, then that means that that exercise is good for improving cardiovascular health. And if not, it is an exercise that is still a valid exercise, but it might not be uh, great for improving cardiovascular health because it's not a cardio exercise, right? So kids who got the kids in the earlier example that did the um, the incline push-ups, right? They leaned against the wall and did push-ups this way. They had an increase in their heart rate, but it wasn't very significant. And they did hit a homeostasis heart rate or homeostatic heart rate for that exercise, but it wasn't particularly high. And so that group would um, identify that that particular exercise is not excellent for improving 
cardiovascular health, it might be a good strength building exercise instead. Does that help answer your question, Kim? That's relatively new. That's been in there, I think maybe only two years, that component. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that uh, that question is like kind of frames the conclusion. So it's really, and I know that sometimes my kids don't recognize what I'm looking for. And that, that chart helps a lot with, you actually have to do that calculation and then you have to go back and look at your graph and see if, especially at the plateau, is it in within that 70 to 80%, 85% range? And that kind of frames their claim actually. Cause exactly. I and I, and cause I know that this is coming. I always ask this question of every group in the data discussion. Thanks. So like, where does your, where does your heart, where, where does your group's heart rate plateau? And, you know, and then I have them write that also on their data sharing slide so that it's, they know exactly what that value is so that when they get this calculation of the target heart rate between 70 and 80% of maximum, 70 and 85% of maximum, then they know what they're comparing to. They can pretty quickly see whether or not their plateau heart rate is within that range or not. And I think it's hard if they, if you don't emphasize that, they may write in their conclusion like, yeah, this is a great cardiovascular exercise because it got the heart rate going really fast, but they kind of missed the point that you were looking for a range within that. So you kind of have to, if you want them to write the conclusion in a way that actually addresses the question, you have to kind of keep reminding them of what they're going for. Right. And I, I have a few, fair number of students like who are um, think that who, who are go going for things like careers like um, athletic training or physical trainer or um, things like that. And this is the kind of thing that they need to know for that kind of job. And so um, so that also comes up quite a, a fair bit in our in our conversations about this lab. So there are a fair number of supports here, teacher notes that will tell you all about these vernier heart rate monitors. I have just gotten some of these uh, non-handheld ones and I had forgotten, Jason, about the water on the hands. That is gonna be a key that we need to write down. <laughs> we have different ears, I get different sets of results, so. I go through those examples. And then lastly, so at the end of the unit, um, I give students an opportunity now that they've done the heart rate investigation to go back to their model that they made in the previous task and to revise that model because they've then now had the experience. And so they may be able to add the things like those qualitative observations about breathing more uh, breathing more heavily or sweating because both of those are kind of byproducts of the heart rate. And we as educators know about the heart rate respiration connection. Um, and somebody asked earlier, where do we bring in respiration into patterns? Um, it definitely comes up. We didn't discuss it here, but it's in the materials um, that respiration is the or cellular respiration is the actual need or the reason that the heart rate increases is because the body requires additional oxygen during, or cells need additional oxygen during exercise in order to, um, to break down glucose. So they can add in those ideas into their map, into their, into their model. Um, we've also know that there are some patterns teachers who incorporate um, a bromothymol blue test like a before and after exercise test, you know, blowing uh, blowing through a straw into bromothymol blue just to recognize the um, the expelling of more carbon dioxide. Of course, it changes the pH of bromothymol blue. So there are different ways that you can incorporate more or less of that um, type of type of thing. But what I like about giving students an opportunity to revise their model at this point is that they can add in. Um, all of the things that they experienced when they um, when they were doing their when they were doing their investigation. So sometimes I've thought about, or one thing I am going to do this year is I'm going to create uh, pre-printed cards 
um, that show the same thing that that drag and drop model does that I showed you earlier. I'm going to do some pre-printed cards uh, um, that students will be able to use to build their uh, initial map and then uh, maybe have them ha use the sticky notes for the uh, for the additional things that they may add later. Um, I've also incorporated this model um, onto the actual exam or onto the test. Um, I think that it's a great opportunity for them to have, you know, a couple of rounds of practice with this sort of modeling in the classroom with support and then um, have them have uh, opportunity to show what they're able to remember um, about how to develop those things. <laughs> right? <laughs> I love to, I tell students that all the time, right? When you weigh, if you were to weigh yourself in the morning, weigh yourself at night, right? Before you go to sleep and weigh yourself in the morning, right? When you get up, you actually weigh less. Their, their minds are blown. They don't really think about that. <laughs> so there's a, um, an example, bigger example of what that drag and drop um, model looks like. And so I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna try to work on some pre-printed cards for this this year. So we've talked um, through all the tasks um, and in each time or in each section, we identified some things that could be used as academic evidence, uh, possible assessment uh, material. Um, the inquiry, of course, or the investigation can uh, certainly uh, uh, applies to HSLS 1-3 because it very specifically says plan and conduct an investigation that shows that feedback loops create, uh, maintain homeostasis. And then, of course, we're dealing with the scientific practices um, in, in that investigation as well. So your district may or may not have standards uh, for the grade book associated with the scientific practices. I know that um, a fair number of districts, when they're revising, are kind of going that direction. Um, but then they can also be assessed, certainly, on a test. There is a test for th that's written available for this unit. Um, in my my team at my school is moving more towards smaller assessments rather than one kind of hit it all at once test at the end of the unit. Um, so we've tended to move to a little bit more towards smaller quizzes along the way and compiling those scores. And then uh, you have the understanding cancer task where they have a summary where they're writing about cell division and changes to that. Um, I've also in the past incorporated the Henrietta Lacks argumentation as a part of some or as a part of a grade that I put into the grade book, really under the scientific practices, though it's not necessarily directly connected to a standard. So I put that in our scientific inquiry um, part of our grading system. But there is um, a way and you could certainly pick up also the um, calculations around um, around the cell cycle for HSLS 1-4 as well. So we're done a little early, which I anticipated. I'd like to open the floor for questions. Um, but before anybody goes, I want if you, if you don't ha have any questions or don't feel that you need to stay for the q and I do, would like to, um, let me get this link. Um, we are required to offer and to strongly encourage you. We would really would like to have your feedback. Um, this exit ticket's actually a requirement of the grant that pays you to be here today. So we would really appreciate it if you could um, fill in that uh, that form. But at the same time, we would love to have uh Certainly, if you need to, if you need to drop off, you're welcome to do that now. You will get paid for your two hours, but we would love to answer any questions that anybody may have um, about this unit or about others. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.